Hi guys, I am yeah, forgotten how to talk. Okay, I am in nature right now for reasons I can't even really explain other than that I just wanted to exercise without going to the gym for once. And I, I, does it even count as hiking if you don't have new balances or a backpack or a walking stick of some kind? Because I'm wearing jeans and vans, and I'm just pretty much walking around. So the audio quality probably isn't going to be great, but that's kind of a hallmark for my personal brand. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you guys about one of my hobbies, which is screenwriting. Not that I do a lot of it myself, but I love reading a lot of screenplays. And so I've been working my way through the 2018 Blacklist, which is the list of the top unproduced screenplays in Hollywood, as voted on by writers, agents, other Hollywood people. And it's a lot of different varieties of stories being told, although the majority of the ones that are topping the list are all biopics about famous people or about people who aren't necessarily known by name, but whose creations are. For instance, the top, or one of the top two finishing screenplays, one is Frat Boy Genius, which is about the founder of Snapchat, and another one is uh, King Richard, about Venus and, Cyril, bleh, Venus and Serena Williams' father. So, those are the types of scripts that seem to be getting a lot of traction these days. But the script that I want to talk to you about is the worst guy of all time and the girl who came to kill him. I believe that's the full title, but um, yeah, it's by Michael Daldron, who's worked on Community, who's worked on Rick and Morty, and it kind of shows in a weird way in that, ah, sitting on a log hurts. Um, it kind of shows in a weird way in that the script has a lot of referential humor, you know? It sort of relies on you being a pop culture sensitive person. The story is about, well here, the premise is what if the social media influencer were elected president? And then it takes that premise and extrapolates a sort of uh, Orwellian post-apocalyptic future in which the guy Barrett Duke, otherwise or Barrett Dukes, otherwise known as the Duke, is essentially running this militant organization of blood grunts who are sort of establishing martial law, who are restricting reproductive rights, or rather giving it so that, like, men take the pill now rather than women, um, and other weird things like, you know, I don't know, it's just implied that he's turned his world into a radioactive wasteland, and that it's hell on earth actually living there because everyone's a misogynist, and it's basically the nightmare scenario that people assumed would happen when Trump was elected, but, like, turned up to a thousand, uh, in that, you know, nobody has rights, nobody really has freedom, everyone is a tool, everyone dabs at everyone else as a salute. It's like that type of thing. It's like if Logan Paul were elected president. And so the uh, script takes this and tells a story in which a resistance fighter by the name of Dixie is sent back to kill Barrett Dukes, uh, before he becomes the Duke. But within that kernel is a love story that develops that... <sighs> it's so hard because, like, I want to talk about this script and I don't feel like I'm giving enough frame of reference to be able to describe it appropriately, but the long story short is that she wants to kill him but can't bring herself to do it because in the past he's so lonely and pathetic that it's clear that his influencer persona is just clearly a put-on to mask the fact that he doesn't have any real friends in life. You know, the, he hosts a reality show called called The Meming of Life, which I, I don't even, I'm not entirely sure what the premise of that reality show is, but it's not really that important. What is important is kind of the way that Michael Daldron writes, in that his voice 
suggests someone who's constantly breaking the fourth wall with his scripts. And any amateur writers are basically told not to do this, but I've seen every blacklist script sort of do this. There's a scene where he talks about how this person should be played by The Rock, or this fight scene is going to be nominated for an MTV Movie Award, but it's not going to win because it's going to lose to something that happens later on in the script, like actual passages. And then a lot of it is using other movies as shorthand for what happens. So, you know, Dixie comes running down the aisle, or walking down the aisle like Nicole Kidman in the end of Moulin Rouge, or Barrett high-fives Randy the way that Moose and Mav or Goose and Maverick do in Top Gun. Or, you know, Barrett leads a choreographed number straight out of Boogie Nights. Or in the exact next sentence, it says, uh, Barrett goes to a Mad Men-style house party. You know, it's just this weird mishmash of tropes and genres. And there's a piece partway through... Okay, you know what? Like, I'm just going to spoil this movie on the premise that even if it does get made... The, by the time it does get made, you will have forgotten all about this. But, okay, Dixie goes back in time to kill Barrett, but ends up falling in love with him when she kind of sees a kindred spirit in him because they've both been incredibly lonely throughout their entire lives. And they end up having sex, and she gets pregnant and decides to stay in the past with him. But at the same time, one of uh, Barrett's, or the Duke's followers follows him back and follows Dixie back into the past to try to stop her from killing the Duke. And uh, it's sort of a reverse Terminator situation. But in doing so, he's, he gets stuck in the past too because his sort of time watch breaks. And he ends up sort of discovering 4chan and becoming this red pillar. And Long, I'll, I'll just abbreviate it to say that, you know, Barrett figures out that Dixie kills the Duke in the opening scene, because that's what happens, you know? The opening is more or less, the Duke attacks the Resistance hideout, and Dixie manages to kill the Duke in 2076. But that doesn't solve the problem of him. She has to go back and kill him before he becomes the Duke. It's like a Bioshock Infinite situation. And so what ends up happening is that Barrett finds out from Miller, who's his follower who followed him into the past, that uh, Dixie is the one who kills him in the future, in 2076. And so that leads to like a split in his and Dixie's relationship and he decides to lean into becoming the Duke. He decides to run for president. He decides to be more of a dick than he already was. And you eventually find out that the reason he's doing this is because he doesn't want Dixie to disappear because he realizes that if he chooses not to run for president, that the future will never happen and Dixie will disappear and so will their unborn child. And it's this rich sort of morally ambiguous sort of story but it's so preposterous that I found a hard time reconciling what this would be like as an actual movie uh, because really a lot of it depends on buying into the central love story which I'm not entirely sure people are going to and a lot of the comedy is very Family Guy-ish in that, not in the cutaway humor, but in the referential style of humor. I mean, it makes sense that this is a person who has a history with community and with Rick and Morty, you know? But ultimately, the script needs more of an emotional through line, in my opinion, in that Barrett is such a dick at times that uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with wanting to keep Dixie alive, that it makes him a really obnoxious and unlikable character. And then Dixie, on the other hand, she's portrayed as this cool, badass, sort of Charlize Theron atomic blonde, you know, but it's also this difficult thing where her commander doesn't want to be the one, this, uh, doesn't want her to be the one to go back in time 
because he feels that she's going to become too emotional and she's not going to be able to pull the trigger when the time comes. And within 10 pages, like, the commander is proven right. And throughout the movie, he's sort of proven right in her being the wrong one to send back for the purpose of killing him. But ultimately, she is kind of the right person to send back because she fundamentally changes who Barrett is so that he never becomes the Duke. See what I mean? And, um, so he pledges at the end, you know, basically both uh, Miller shoots both Barrett and Dixie because he realizes that if Barrett isn't going to become the Duke, somebody has to. And so it might as well be me, Miller, the guy who posts on 4chan and who is a red pillar and who calls everybody a soy boy cuck. It's just, you know, that type of script. And so as this happens, uh, Barrett is resolving never to become the Duke, it's sort of resetting the timeline, and Miller starts to disappear, and Daisy starts to disappear, and it leads to the biggest laugh, it, laugh in the script for me, which is that Barrett goes to tell Dixie he loves her, but her head disappears first, and he flips out because, like, who... Why? Why... When does the head ever disappear first? Like, he feels like he got ripped off, basically. And so Barrett's story arc comes full circle in the sense that he suddenly becomes a philanthropist. Like, instead of leaning into just not becoming the Duke, he goes so far out of his way to become another person entirely. Like, he's not a jerk anymore, he donates to charity, he wins a lot of humanitarian awards, and you think, well, okay, you know, the world has gained something but at tremendous loss to Barrett personally. And it feels like a nice place to leave his character. You know, it's a bittersweet ending, but it means something. But then, no, like, Dixie appears from the future, saying that they have a five-year-old daughter now, and more or less that the timeline reset and everything's happy now. And when he's like, how is this possible? It's just, the literal answer is that just don't think about it, basically. It's a sort of lampshading of time travel movie tropes. So, I, it's, it's like Terminator meets Back to the Future. It's an incredibly weird movie, and I felt like that ending beat sort of compromised everything else that the script had been building up even though it's very much in line with the satirical nature of everything that came before it. So, why talk about this then? Well, ultimately, I mean, people that I talk to, both online and in person, they don't really care about screenplays. I love the art form of it, and I love reading them, and I love finding out... I love sort of, like, casting these movies in my head, and sort of seeing what it is these stories are before the studio system sort of comes along and changes whatever it is about it. You know, I still remember reading an early draft of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and the actual film cut a lot of things out of that original script. You know, there's this whole sort of frame story with pieces of it that take place in the future, and, you know, it's stuff that wasn't really necessary to the story that got told, so I'm glad they cut it, but it's an interesting look into the process of movie making, because it is a very collaborative process. But, ultimately, this script had a lot of really cool action set pieces, and it has a very clear and distinctive voice, even if I don't really feel the sense of humor of it. And it would have had a really satisfying emotional through line, except that all of it kind of gets undone at the end, like Barrett gets to have his cake and eat it too. And while that makes for a happier Hollywood ending, I still feel like there's something more that could have, be, could have been gotten out of this, I suppose. But that's just nitpicking, I guess. I probably should have edited this instead of just doing one long ramble because... 
I don't know how many people are going to watch this, but it's whatever. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Ultimately, where I'm at with this, I give it a 6 out of 10. It's good, but I ultimately felt disappointed in how it ended because I thought there could have been so much more that was done. But it's a very brisk read, so if you can find this script online, I recommend downloading it and giving it a read, even though I just spoiled it all for you, but it's still worth reading because there's a lot, it, it paints a very vivid picture, and I think that, hey, it'll take you like an hour to read, so it's whatever, that's, if you find yourself stuck at the DMV, there are worse options, and you can just have it on a little PDF reader on your phone and go through it, and, you know, it's nice, it's there, you know, it's cool, but Anyway, thanks for watching if you have watched this, because I assume the watch time on this is going to be like two minutes tops, but that's just me being pessimistic a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, hope you're having a great day, and hope you guys uh, stick around on the channel. Uh, have a good one, everyone.